Welcome to In Focus with Ajaz Heather. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has expressed gratitude for Islamabad's continued support for the, for the Afghan peace process. This according to a Pentagon readout of the phone conversation between Austin and Pakistan Army Chief General Kamar Bajwa. Austin had called Bajwa while returning from Afghanistan where he made an unannounced stop last Sunday. The Biden administration is reviewing the U.S.-Afghan policy and has shared a draft with all stakeholders, including the Taliban. There's also the proposal to pull in the United Nations to further the process by involving all regional powers. There is some talk of extending the withdrawal deadline for U.S. troops, originally scheduled for May 1st. The Taliban have so far rejected the delay in withdrawal. But it is clear that the Biden administration is trying to fast-track the process that sense of urgency came through a letter U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken wrote to Afghan President Ashraf Ghani some three weeks ago. Before Austin, the U.S. point diplomat for Afghan peace and reconciliation process, Zalme Khalilzad, has been in the region to discuss the salient features of the process. Austin also spoke at a press conference in Afghanistan before his departure and said his engagements in Kabul would inform his participation in the review we are undergoing here with the president. It's very helpful. The intra-Afghan talks are stuck on a central point of disagreement. The Taliban won a new power-sharing agreement before a comprehensive ceasefire, while the Ghani government insists on a ceasefire up front and has rejected any interim setup. To discuss this further, I'm joined by Ambassador Najanjua, former Foreign Secretary, Raimullah Yusuf Sai, resident editor of the News, and Dr. Kamran Bukhari, Director of Analytical Development at New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy. Thank you to all my panelists. Let me begin with Ambassador Janjua here. Ambassador Janjua, your initial thoughts about the Austin unannounced stop in Kabul, what he uh, said to uh, the Army Chief here, and uh, what he said at the presser in Kabul. Uh, well, once, well, firstly, let's look at what he said to the army chief, which is something that we must appreciate that there is recognition of what Pakistan has been doing. And this should also be uh, contextualized in what uh, General Badwa said in the Islamabad Security Conference uh, held recently, where he said, our robust role in the current quest for peace in Afghanistan is a proof of our goodwill and understanding of our global and moral obligations. So this is something that's been recognized and appreciated is something that we must um, uh, be grateful for. Um, we must be happy with. Uh, nevertheless, uh, let's also put the entire visit in a certain context. The context uh, is that uh, the, uh, the, the former general and now defense secretary, Austin, took a visit, uh, let's look, his, look at his trajectory. The trajectory starts from Hawaii, which is the command, the Indo-Pacific Command Headquarters, where he got a, a briefing on the Indo-Pacific uh, actions or, or possibilities that uh, the U.S. is looking at. Then he went to uh, Japan and to South Korea. South Korea may not be a part of the Indo-Pacific um, strategy as such right now, but Japan is very much so. And then he went to India, which of course is a part of the Quad, as you know. So it's an interesting background that is there and the interesting backdrop. Then he goes to Afghanistan. Now, recently in the Islamabad conference as well, there was a, some comments made by Ambassador Munter, former ambassador of the US to Pakistan, where he said, we must realize that as far as the US is concerned, their policy is now moving from beyond the borders of Afghanistan into uh, beyond the borders of Gabbaga into India and beyond that. And therefore, basically, the Indian, the, uh, the U.S. focus is the pivot strategy that the, uh, the court strategy, that uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy that they are looking at. And therefore, it's significant from our perspectives as well. Uh, we need to look at these different threats that are there. Nevertheless, it's also important to note that during his visit, um, there was one point that he plugged on, and that was the U.S. is looking at a more responsible 
uh, exit uh, to this end to this conflict and a transition to something else. So a responsible uh, end to the conflict is something which falls in complete line with what uh, the Biden administration has been saying, which is to end all never ending uh, conflicts. Um, then, of course, the important point that is being raised that would have been discussed in uh, Kabul would have been the May 1 deadline for the withdrawal of U.S. troops, which according to a New York Times article is 3,500 and not the 2,500 that was stated earlier. Um, so, um, and of course, then there's this question of the interim government and all the points that you've already raised as well. So it was, uh, as far as uh, Secretary Austin was concerned, he said he was on a listening mode and, and therefore he did not comment in any way on the Taliban uh, keeping the agreement of the 29th February agreement of last year. But he did say that violence had increased. Now, violence increasing in Kabul or in, in the rest of Afghanistan, we must also look in the context that the Taliban are probably not the only uh, actors in Afghanistan. There are many others, the ISIL and many others, who do rake up a lot of violence in Afghanistan. So all of that has to be put into perspective and the important thing is that uh, how can we how can the Taliban and the US government and the Afghan government come to an agreement on ending the the uh, the, the, the war in Afghanistan to say right. our ambassador some, in work some of some of the, uh, uh, was put out by Secretary Blinken in his letter and then, of course, the draft also that I mentioned. Uh, but uh, let me pull in Dr. Kamran Bukhari here. Uh, Kamran Bukhari, uh, it seems to me that essentially, uh, as part of the review process, as uh, Ambassador Janjua also said, that Secretary Austin was more in a listening mode. So I'm assuming that he's kind of, you know, uh, after the Blinken letter, he now wanted to get a sense of where things stand from the Kabul government and then take that back to the table where the review process is being done. Well, absolutely, Jaz. Um, you have to remember that uh, the Biden administration inherited this situation from the Trump administration that had pretty much fast-tracked uh, the negotiation process. Uh, their calculus was tied to the 2020 presidential election and the pres former president's need to show a, a, a win somewhere in, in the foreign policy arena. Uh, and what we're seeing right now is a reevaluation of that uh, the previous administration basically locked the U.S. into uh, what I would call a, a, an artificial date, uh, a May 1st date for withdrawal from the country. And that's where the Taliban are pressing Washington and demanding that they live up to that expectation. Uh, I think that uh, the, if the Biden, if I'm reading the Biden administration correctly, then what they're trying to do is to say, uh, yes, we committed to uh, a May 1st withdrawal, uh, but the conditions that we agreed to, i.e. the intra-Afghan dialogue, have not been met. And therefore, we need to extend this deadline. Uh, and I think that uh, the Taliban, uh, they'll have to call the Taliban bluff that, uh, you know, they're going to resort to violence and the threats that they've been making. Um, you know, the U.S. is very much capable of, of striking back. Uh, and it's not in the Taliban's interest to come this far and then just return. So if uh, I think that that's what the Biden administration is doing, at least it should be doing, because uh, right now uh, the Afghan government and its allies are not able to move forward on that negotiation process, the internal Afghan negotiation process with the Taliban. And therefore, the United States is, has circulated that draft. It is trying to sort of aggressively mediate that process, but it needs time. And uh, the, the deadline is just too close. And, and, and the, the, uh, the progress that needs to be made uh, is not possible in that short period of time. Right. Uh, Rahimullah Yousafzai, Barnett Rubin wrote uh, an article a couple of months ago uh, with reference to this withdrawal issue. And he had a very interesting suggestion. Um, which had to do with the fact that he wanted the United States. Uh, there were two things. One, 
that the intra-Afghan dialogue, because of the prisoner release issue, a number of other issues, got delayed by almost six months. So perhaps Washington could actually talk to the regional players, Pakistan, Qatar, others, and approach this, uh, you know, or broach this issue with the Taliban in a, in a multilateral framework in order to avoid any misunderstandings. Uh, so give me your sense of that proposal. And secondly, would you agree with Kamran Bukhari that this is a Taliban bluff and they're not likely to actually rake up violence after having reached this point? Uh, yes, uh, just let me first say that this was another unannounced secret visit by an American senior official, General Austin. No visit by any American official at that level has been announced beforehand. Uh, although we all know for the last 13 months, no American in Afghanistan or no NATO um, member has been attacked by Taliban. So that must be kept in mind. I think they should now come on announced visit to Afghanistan instead of coming on unannounced visits. Uh, secondly, you know, uh, this uh, withdrawal period was 14 months. It was not too soon or too long, I think. Taliban were demanding six months, uh, you know, period, and then eight months, and then finally they agreed to have this 14-month period, and the Americans also agreed. Uh, yes, I agree with Barnett Rubin that about five and a half months were wasted because of the dispute over the release of uh, prisoners. I will call it exchange of prisoners, because 5,000 Taliban prisoners were to be exchanged with 1,000 Afghan government servicemen. So that, uh, you know, Ashraf Ghani did not, uh, you know, want to release them, um, but there was an American pressure. Finally, he called al Jirga, and, uh, you know, the al Jirga approved this proposal to release them. So I think those five and a half months should be added to this period. And that's why, you know, I think the Americans, as General, uh, as President Biden is saying, that, uh, you know, it could happen, but it will be tough to withdraw by that uh, first May. And he says, if he, even if he stay longer, it will not be a lot longer. So I think he has maybe a few months in mind. Now, I think the uh, uh, American interest to involve, uh, you know, other countries, a multilateral uh, kind of an arrangement. I think that's uh, sensible, and that is also doable, uh, because you know, as the Americans have realized, they can't do it alone, and no other country can do it alone. So that's why, you know, we had this Moscow meeting, and now there will be this meeting in Istanbul, Turkey, and then the UN-sponsored uh, conference. So I think. You know, you have to involve all the uh, stakeholders, important stakeholders, the regional powers. Uh, you know, Qatar was represented along with Turkey as observers in the Moscow meeting, uh, along with these four important stakeholders, US, China, um, Pakistan, and Russia. So I think these are, uh, you know, um, some uh, new ideas. Uh, which could lead to some progress. I have heard, I haven't confirmed it, that Taliban have come up with a proposal, uh, you know, the 90-day, the three-month period of reducing violence or uh, some kind of a ceasefire. They have come with a proposal. I don't know, uh, you know, how much they want to reduce, how can that be measured if there has been a reduction in violence. But if that is true, that is some progress. Right. Interestingly enough, Ambassador Janjua, our official position so far has been uh, that the U.S. should uh, act according to the original formula, which is withdrawal by uh, 1st May. Uh, perhaps at some point we might change that. But I wanted to ask you, given that uh, the, there's not much progress in the intra-Afghan talks and also not much reduction in violence, and considering that we want a responsible withdrawal. How do we square this requirement with, uh, with our, uh, you know, official position that withdrawal should take place by May 1st? 
withdrawal, uh, you see, we have to be honest brokers in all of this. And the honest broker thing is that there was an agreement that was made. There was a deadline that was indicated. And as Rahimullah Yusuf Saeed have said, it was about 14 months that was that was given in the agreement for the withdrawal. So that's why our official position would continue to be one to adhere to the agreement that was made on uh, on for, on last year. Um, realistically, uh, what Barnard Rubin has said and what Rahimullah Yusuf Saeed has said is something that we uh, also need to take into account. Uh, there's a new administration in uh, Washington that needs to look, assess up all the uh, the various options that are there. They have opted. They have made some proposals, and uh, and let's see what comes from and the the Afghan government. But the Afghan government has clearly said one of the important points that has been made by the U.S. administration, by Blink Press, Secretary of State Blink, Blinken, is the is an interim government, and that's one that uh, President Ghani has clearly said is not acceptable. But obviously, there will have to be a lot of talking done, not only with the Afghan government, but the U.S. government also needs to reach out to the Taliban because it's the Taliban that have an agreement with uh, the U.S. government. As our ambassador in Washington said recently that they to, the peace process has two pillars. One is U.S. and uh, Taliban, and the other is the inter-Afghan dialogue. So all of them have to sort of work together in order to get to some uh, progress as such. The only thing is that, and I must say that uh, Secretary of Defense Austin was more diplomatic than many diplomats when he talked about when he did not comment on the situation in Afghanistan or did not comment on uh, the, the holding of the agreement by the Taliban because it does not help to push uh, negative views in the process. And I must say in this, con in this context, the comment made by Stoltenberg, the, the NATO Secretary General, when he said that we will leave when, when uh, the time is right, is, does not help. Because at the end of the day, there are certain agreements that have been made. So as far as Pakistan is concerned, uh, officially, we will continue to adhere, I think, to the, to the deadline that's been indicated. But of course, there has to be conversations between the Taliban and the U.S. government and the, Talib and the intra afghan dialogue to take some uh, movement. Right. Tamran Bukhari, two questions. One is, of course, as Rehmullah Yousafzai said, the lots of conferences happening. It's just the Moscow conference and one perhaps scheduled for Istanbul. And then the UN conference. Uh, there's going to be the heart of Asia, one in Dushanbe. Uh, uh, a, uh, I hope these are not taking place in silos. And that there's at some point, uh, you know, a lot of note sharing in terms of what's happening. And secondly, uh, going back to, as you mentioned, uh, Trump administration was fast tracking it for a completely different reason. But as I said, Secretary Blinken's letter is also very clear that they also want to fast track it. And uh, to me, it seems that they perhaps want to fast track it because A, there is a, a fairly heavy uh, agenda of issues at home. And then going by what happened at Anchorage uh, in the initial meeting uh, between the top uh, Chinese and US diplomats, the kind of uh, slanging match that we saw uh, in front of the cameras, is also something that, you know, in terms of uh, changing priorities, uh, US priorities, in terms of, you know, uh, the upcoming challenges in the rest of it, they, they perhaps want to sort of, uh, you know, get rid of this particular issue. Uh, yes, Ijaz, on your first question, look, um, the U.S. broader strategy for the globe as it is uh, in sort of the post-Afghanistan, post-Iraq world is for regional players to do the heavy lifting and the United States take a back seat. So all these conferences that are taking place, Dushanbe, and other places like in Turkey and, and getting the multilateral forum of the UN involved, uh, they're geared towards that. So where the United States is not the only one uh, expending its resources to deal with the situation. Um, it, it is in the US interest to say, okay, when we withdraw, that there will be others that will feel the need to play a role 
regardless of what the United States does. This is a strategy that's global. It has nothing to do with South Asia or the Middle East. Uh, the, to your second question, look, uh, that is the main issue. And in a recent, um, about a week ago, I, I published an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal saying that, look, the Biden administration is talking about uh, the, the need to meet the challenges from Russia and China and the other uh, sub-challenges that emerge from both and other actors in the world. Uh, as far as China and Russia are concerned, there is a big gaping hole in the strategic thinking of the Biden administration, which is that they did fail to mention in the strategic guidance document that was issued by the White House, signed by the president, uh, the, in the, the very strategic region of Central Asia. Uh, if the United States does not have a footprint there, if Russia has still retains a lot of influence, the Chinese are pushing in with their investments and very aggressively through BRI and, and other mechanisms, um, then how can we counter China? Uh, the maritime issue is settled. The United States faces no challenges on the high seas from either the Chinese or the Russians. It's, it's, this is a land issue, and this is why the Chinese are investing so much in Central Asia. So there's a need for the United States to rethink all of that. And I think the two are connected. You withdraw from Afghanistan. You get the regional players involved uh, in the process. You hope that there will be some mechanism uh, where there is some form of authority in Kabul that trickles down to the provinces, and there's a method to the madness. There is no good end to the war. The United States has accepted that, and it accepted that, uh, dating back to the Bush administration. So what we're seeing since then is a way to come to a closure. Uh, it, and the closure achieves two things. One is there is some security arrangement, however flawed. Number two is that the United States uh, has what is called a uh, an orderly withdrawal, and it does not send a message to all negative forces in the region, uh, whether they're non-state actors or state actors, that somehow the United States, this is Vietnam all over again. So this is what the United States is doing, and I think that uh, Central Asia will be the link between the withdrawal from Afghanistan and dealing with the Chinese uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Right. Uh, on that, I will return to you, uh, Kamran, but let me take this to uh, Rahimullah Yousafzai. Uh, Rahimullah Yousafzai, one of the things that we see, if we even a cursory glance at Afghanistan's history, uh, clearly tells us that regardless of who was in Kabul, whether it was Zahir Shah, whether it was the President Daoud, whether it was PDPA, whether it, the Soviets came in, and so on and so forth, that the countryside, uh, the, the different solidarity groups that lived there, they negotiate with the external world, and the external world includes Kabul. And every time uh, Kabul has actually negotiated, things have been smooth. But every time Kabul has tried, and once again, whether it was Zahir Shah, Daoud, or anyone, to try and centralize things, the countryside has risen up in revolt. Now, as we move forward, and of course, lots of you know, water has run down several rivers since then, do you think that there is a possibility of a central government or uh, or strong central government, or some kind of uh, local government system wedded to a, a, a federal system that is likely to work better uh, in Afghanistan? You know, there have been demands in recent years that Afghanistan should be made a federation. There should be a federal system with more autonomy and that kind of thing. But it is not really being supported by the important players. So maybe among the non-Pashtuns, there is some support for this demand because they believe the Pashtuns have always been in power, uh, whether they were kings, whether they were, uh, you know, uh, presidents, Mujahideen, Taliban, uh, even now, the present regime is led by a Pashtun. So I think that demand will remain, but I don't see any easy solution for that. Uh, yes, you know, look at the Afghanistan today. Uh, you know, the urban centers are controlled by the government. 65% of the population is living in the urban areas. 
and they are run by the government. Although there may be anti-government elements as well in these cities, and the rural areas are mostly controlled by Taliban. Uh, so, you know, the um, urban Afghanistan, you know, for example, Kabul, Kandahar, uh, you know, these were a lot more modern and urbanized uh, than one can imagine. And, you know, even in the 60s and maybe even earlier, you could see women wearing skirts and going to universities and colleges. And look what happened after that. So I think there have been these two different uh, thinkings uh, in Afghanistan in that's the urban and rural uh, areas. That's actually a very, very interesting uh, divide that you talked about, and perhaps we should look at it at some point because, it, it, you know, that divide has kind of uh, stayed uh, through the past four or five decades. But thank you so much. That was Rehmullah Yusufzai speaking with us. Uh, let me quickly go back to Ambassador Janjua here. Ambassador Janjua, so we talked about what our official position is right now. But given the policy review, and of course, that'll be the draft has been shared with us. Uh, the policy review will also be shared with us. Uh, then perhaps in combination with other friendly countries, uh, we might uh, re revisit our position with reference to the withdrawal, or we might propose some other kind of multilateral force to take over, and the U.S. withdrawal should go ahead as planned. Well, the deadline of 1st May is far too soon for a multilateral force to be, uh, in, to be sort of sent in. There were in the past proposals of an OIC force or a UN force, but these things are rather difficult at this time. I think, as I said earlier, uh, we'll of course have, we are continuing to consult. Our special envoy for Afghanistan was in Iran, and he has been, he will be participating in all the conferences that are being, being held. Of course, uh, speaking to all, we continue to talk to all our partners. The Uzbek foreign minister was in Pakistan as well, and all these tie in into what the region would be looking at. But um, I think at the end of the day, as I said earlier, the agreement was between the U.S. and the Taliban, and the U.S. and the Taliban need to have a conversation on what the impediments are. And, if, and of course, I'm sure uh, the rational uh, way in which the Taliban have been working in these negotiations with the, Afghan, uh, with the U.S. government uh, will all will be helpful in in uh, looking at the date again as well, uh, the, as Rimula Sab also said that President Biden recently said that there would be the withdrawal is uh, on the first of May is top, but it will have to be uh, but it will not be very long. Uh, those are some sort of straws in the wind that one can look at, and at the end of the day, it is going to be an agreement between. Uh, the Taliban and the U.S. government. And of course, the, the Afghan government will have to also enter into to such a conversation because the Afghan government itself was not very comfortable with the first May deadline as well. So um, we are, with the government of Pakistan's position is based on the matter of principle that there's an agreement and that the yeah. deadline should be met. But... That principle, of course, uh, depends on what the, the main protagonists think about the deadline. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was Ambassador Tamina Janjua speaking with us. Before I wrap this segment, let me go back to Kamran Bukhari. Uh, a segue of sorts, uh, well, not really, uh, KB, but uh, you mentioned uh, Chinese investments in Central Asia. Now, very recently, Fareed Zakria, in his take on his program, uh, talked about, uh, very clearly talked about perhaps uh, a rethink uh, in the U.S. approach to China with reference to where you talked about the Pentagon, defense spending and the rest of it. And interestingly enough, also talked about this $1.7 trillion, uh, you know, price tag uh, for the F-35s uh, compared to the nearly $1.7 trillion that constitutes the monies uh, in, in the BRI program. So, so I just wanted to get your take on whether this old style thinking of uh, peer com competition is something that uh, needs to be rethought in, in Washington, D.C. 
Absolutely. And I think that, you know, there are many in Washington who are pushing for, uh, you know, an out of the box kind of approach to strategic matters. Um, so, I mean, and, and we have to understand that uh, the old sort of, you know, peer to peer competition uh, isn't uh, what we're dealing with. The world has changed um, technologically. Uh, the, the, the global economy has changed. There are other players that are emerging. And we need to understand that. I think that Washington needs to understand uh, what it means to be a superpower. My former boss and mentor, George Friedman, in his latest book, uh, makes a strong case that the United States, uh, even 30 years out from the end of the Cold War, is still struggling to uh, come up with the institutional fabric in Washington to uh, manage the world as a superpower. And how will it do that? So we're, there's a, the U.S. still needs to uh, reconfigure itself. And I think the next 10 years will be spent on that, uh, especially given that there are so many domestic challenges within the United States uh, that, that need uh, uh, to be attended to. But to go back to you know the BRI and what the Chinese are doing, uh, we really have to understand. I mean, there's a, there is, I, as I see it, there is sort of like, um, a polarized view. Most people think that China is rising and they take that for granted and they don't really deconstruct what does that mean, you know, what is the extent to which the Chinese are, are uh, threatening the U.S. position or its interests in various parts of the world. Um, and then there are those who are sort of in the comfort zone saying, no, we're, we're fine and we just need to stay the course. And that's largely where we are. And somewhere in between, uh, there are people who are discussing and talking about a more nuanced approach. So let's look at BRI. BRI uh, is taking advantage of the fact that, in, in, in Central Asia specifically, uh, is taking advantage of the fact that the Russian financial situation has weakened. And it's, it's a receding power in Central Asia. We saw that in the Caucasus with Nagorno-Karabakh, where the yes. Turks inserted themselves into what is a Russian sphere of influence. The Chinese are seeing that. The Chinese are pushing into Central Asia. They one third of all Ch Chinese natural gas supplies come from Turkmenistan, and Turkmenistan right now has only a single customer for its natural gas imports, China. So it's not just roads and rail and, and traffic; it's also energy uh, supplies and, and, as well. And, and, and so, that that was uh, sorry, I, I because I'm out of time, but that's precisely the kind of point that. Uh, Fareed Zakria was making uh, in relation to uh, money spent well. Uh, but of course, this is something that uh, we need to take up at uh, some other point also for, for a more uh, elaborate discussion. But thank you. That was Dr. Kamran Bukhari speaking with us. We shall take a short break and return to discuss Pakistan's deal with Turkey for 30 attack helicopters that is being blocked by the U.S. Stay with us. Welcome back to In Focus. Pakistan's $1.5 billion deal for 30 Turkish T-129 attack helicopters remains a victim of U.S.-Turkey tensions over Ankara's purchase of Russian S-400A to AD system. As a backgrounder, Pakistan signed the deal with Turkey in July 2018 to replace its aging AH-1F Cobra gunships fleet. But the story goes back to 2016 when Pakistan extensively tested the T-129 in Pakistan at the height of summer months. At the time, Defense News quoted a TAI official as saying that they had been very surprised by just how harsh the conditions were. Still, they were pleased with the T-129's performance, which also greatly impressed the Pakistan army. Earlier, China had sent three of its Z-10 helicopters four trials in Pakistan, but Pakistan's appraisal teams were not sufficiently impressed. But the deal has got mired in U.S.-Turkey tensions because the engine and some other parts are made by American firm Honeywell in collaboration with Rolls-Royce. Pakistan has given two extensions to Turkey so far, but as one senior Turkish procurement official has said, this is not a technological or commercial issue, it is purely political, and as long as the reasons for the U.S. blockade remain in effect, what looks like a Turkish-Pakistani deal will be a victim of Turkish-U.S. dispute. To discuss this further, 
I'm joined by Abdul Noor Tumi, who's a researcher at the Center for Middle Eastern Strategic Studies, Mohammad Walid, who's a journalist and defense analyst based in Istanbul, and Gordon Adams, who's Professor Emeritus, American University School of International Service, Distinguished Fellow at Quincy Institute and Stimson Center, and co-editor of Mission Creep, the Militarization of U.S. Foreign Policy. Let me begin with Mohammad Walid here. Mohammed Walid, give me a sense of what's happening because, as I said, Pakistan is given two extensions. Pakistan fully understands uh, Turkey's compulsion. But the signals that we're getting from uh, Turkish officials uh, are that this might not go through. There are two possibilities that we can actually see happening in future. Number one, America may agree to give the engine or the permission to export them, actually. Turkey, uh, Turkey, uh, there, there is no problem to deliver those engines to Turkey, but uh, the problem is uh, they, they put an obstacle for the export to Pakistan. And as you have mentioned before, um, the reason is mostly political. Uh, there is no technical reason because Pakistan Air Force and military uses uh, Western weapons and American weapons as well. So uh, now there is a chance that the new administration in the United States may may uh, reconsider their decision because otherwise, it's obviously America's um, uh, a competitor, China, will get the deal. So there is a hope. On the other hand. Uh, Turkey has developed a better engine itself. It's now under licensing process. Uh, Turkish engine industry has tested the engine successfully several times. It's working good, and it's 200 horsepower uh, more. I mean, 200 horsepower extra stronger than the the uh, this uh, previous uh, American and British. Uh, engine of uh, attack T129 helicopter. So uh, there are so these two options would be on the table, and I believe that it's always uh, better. It would be better for Pakistan if we if they go uh, with this uh, attack instead of uh, any other uh, chopper because it's extremely well tested and it's uh, combat proven in in very harsh weather condition, as you said. Right. Um, just to uh, prize our viewers, um, the Mohammed Bali's point, yes, Turkey has been developing its engine. Uh, Turkey had also got a lobbying firm uh, that obviously that effort uh, did not uh, succeed. But as I said in my opening, uh, one of the reasons that uh, Pakistan Army appraisal teams went for attack uh, T129 was because of the engine, because uh, the Z10 engine, uh, which is WZ, WZ9, uh, was considered to be underpowered compared to the, the, the mass and weight of the attack helicopter itself. But let me pull in uh, Professor Adams here. Professor Adams, uh, give me your sense of, uh, I mean, Turkey is a NATO ally. Pakistan uh, has been allied with the United States. Uh, there are convergence of interests now, at least in Afghanistan, although it's not a strategic partner. There's also a sense that perhaps one of the reasons that uh, Washington is doing this is to uh, not allow Pakistan an edge over India, which already is in possession of the Apache attack helicopters from the United States. Do you think that sense is correct? Certainly one element in it. What you have here, to put it in context, is a microcosm of the new world disorder that we're all dealing with. The issues here, when you start to unpack them, are very, very complex. Uh, the United States is angry with Turkey because Turkey has been buying the Russian S-400 air defense system, which uh, the United States is very concerned about Turkey bringing into the NATO environment because it can detect probably difficulties with the F-35 fighter the United States is co-producing with Turkey. 
because of the S-400 missile, the United States has, has put sanctions on Turkey, and those are the sanctions that begin to look like they could affect this deal. So there's one piece that is sort of U.S.-Turkish relations, as you said at the opening, that's very important here. Uh, I think the Pakistani relationship is also important uh, because the United States is anxious to close the deal on some kind of peace agreement in Afghanistan, and the, the Pakistani position vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban is going to be an important element. So there may be an incentive to allow the sale to Pakistan in order to encourage the Pakistanis to support that deal. Uh, you widen this circle of political disorder because you bring the Russians into it. Uh, you know, the Russians are involved in the S-400 sale and they're involved in the Middle East more than they ever have and in South Asia. You bring in Pakistani-Indian relationships because the Indians have the Apache helicopter capability, uh, which is a, a, a vastly superior system, actually, to the T-129. But it, the T-129 would significantly improve the Pakistani capabilities vis-a-vis -vis India. And then, of course, you have China where the United States is trying to encourage a relationship between Japan, Australia, India, and, uh, and the U.S., called the Quad, to confront China. So the United States is not anxious to have the Chinese continue to expand their influence in the region. Uh, in other words, you have just about the large mixed stew of global and national issues that you could possibly imagine, all focused on the simple sale of one helicopter program to the Pakistani military. I like your centric circle approach, uh, um, and I agree with uh, with this because if you if you broaden the issue, then obviously a lot of other variables come in. But uh, just as a as a segue of sorts, uh, you talked about the F-35 program. Uh, you obviously familiar with the fact that it has had uh, cost overruns. It has mired in all sorts of troubles, uh, and at the end of the day, recently when it was tested against. F-16 and F-15 Eagles, it was found to be wanting. So, so this this is a 1.7 trillion dollars uh, sort of you know uh, albatross around the neck of Pentagon, uh, and you know uh, so so this is not something I, I'm sure Turkey is not particularly interested in getting this fighter jet anyway. Well, they are interested. In fact, the Turkish are one of the partner. Turkey is one of the partners for the F-35 program, was. along with several other uh, Western European countries. The United States, of course, because of the S-400 missile acquisition by Turkey, uh, has stopped Turkish participation in the F-35 program. Uh, here's the problem: it's a highly capable aircraft, even with its problems, and it's monstrously expensive, and it's had enormous technical difficulties. Uh, but nonetheless, it is the future fighter aircraft program right now for all of the United States military services. Uh, the Army not so much involved, but the Navy, the Air Force, the Marine Corps are all buying it. Uh, we're going to buy 2,000 of these things, love it or leave it. And of course, as an export fighter, it's very important to U.S. participation in the international fighter market. So it's a complex set of relationships. Right. Thank you. That was Professor Gordon Adams speaking with us. Let me go to uh, Abdanur Tumi here. Uh, Mr. Tumi, uh, what do you think? Is, is this going to actually work out, uh, this uh, Pakistan-Turkey deal? Uh, as uh, Mohammed Walid was saying, there's a possibility perhaps Pakistan can also approach the, uh, the Biden administration um, while Turkey also works on this. What are your thoughts about it? Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Uh, actually, yeah, as it was stated uh, earlier by uh, your uh, distinguished guest, it's a very, very complex uh, situation, and also in these uh, new uh, inter uh, international system disorder, and regarding also the regions, uh, turmoils, and also with all these new access uh, geopolitical alliances that are or have been uh, <clears throat> connecting uh, during the last five years. So Turkey is also going to play a major role in, 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 in this uh, complex situation, knowing that is emerging as an effective and efficient uh, leader in, in the region. And not only in the Middle East, but it's extending its influences toward uh, <clears throat> 
South Asia as well. So, and also the uh, bilateral relations between uh, Ankara and Islamabad has been uh, having has been increasing and uh, even uh, showing some frequent states high level visits and also military exchange so which i mean this element which will be added to all these uh, elements of the uh, role of the U.S. and how interesting and interestingly enough, because these two countries are raising countries in the regions are also direct aligned to the U.S. So now in that the U.S. is, I mean, in the previous administration has lost its leverage and even to some extent a little bit of its credibility. But now the new administration of President, uh, President Biden is trying to launch or launch the Obama uh, doctrine in uh, South Asia. And <clears throat> as it was stated by uh, your guest, that the rapprochement with Japan, Australia too, part of to contain China, but also we cannot leave out China so because these two countries are also having some kind of, let's say, a maneuver or margin of maneuver to deal separately from Washington with China in terms of military exchange as right. well. So, the, uh, and then we can add also the role of uh, Moscow into this because, uh, I mean, we all know the Russians, they have been very powerful and strong in the region and extending the relation even, I mean, we saw the latest development in the uh, Afghani political uh, process that they, uh, they host the uh, Taliban uh, groups and they even and uh, yeah, but but here's here's the here's the problem. To me, here's the problem. The the relations with uh, Russia are very complex, uh, both for us as well as for Turkey. But thank you so much uh, for speaking with us. Let me go back to Mohammed Walid here. Uh, Mohammed Walid, let me approach this from a different uh, angle, and and the reason I'm doing that is because. I think the Pakistani-Turkish defense cooperation is not just about uh, the T-129. Uh, as the Turkish president uh, has been saying, uh, there's very serious potential for collaboration with Pakistan on defense projects. Uh, there have been high-level uh, discussions in January also about developing and manufacturing military hardware. There's also a report by Bloomberg and some other outlets talking about the Turkish fighter experimental, which is the TFX, um, in terms of Turkey approaching Pakistan and also thinking in terms of getting some Chinese, uh, you know, help uh, uh, via Pakistan in that project. So, so, th so that means that it's not just about T129. It's it's a, it's a much broader. The scope of this is much broader. So it's uh, you know it, uh, the T129 becomes that much more serious for both the countries in terms of this deal actually going through. Actually, T129 uh, was the first uh, biggest signed deal for both of the countries. But also there are uh, contracts on uh, Navy corvettes that two will be uh, directly sold to Pakistan and two will be uh, manufactured in Karachi with, uh, I mean, through transfer of technology. So this uh, defense cooperation is um, actually absolutely very potential. And at the same time, uh, it, it actually uh, very significant for both of the countries security. So, um, I mean, both for Pakistan and Turkey. So Turkey actually sees a very close, um, uh, I mean, sees Pakistan as a very closed ally. And definitely it approached about TFX, uh, joint manufacturing, and uh, it wants to see Pakistan as a partner in the project. As well, it approached to uh, Malaysia and Indonesia and some other countries. Um, as well, but they, I mean, uh, with Pakistan, they, they, they have uh, more potentials because uh, Pakistan has some experience in developing 
fourth generation fighter jet with uh, with China. So uh, that's the reason why probably uh, Bloomberg has reported that some Chinese technology can uh, can be transferred to to Ankara through Pakistan. But uh, I don't think that. Um, I mean, Turkey will will use uh, very significant Chinese technologies in developing its uh, future generation fighter jet. Um, but because as, yes, because as you I as you as you mentioned, Turkey already also developing its own sensors, sensors technology, its its engines for the helicopter, and I'm assuming also for uh, the fighter jet. Um, so, but but my point really was, and you know, before I wrap up, I just want to get you a quick take on this. My point was that the the cooperation between Turkey and Pakistan uh, is not just limited to the T129. Uh, it's much broader. Uh, the scope is much broader. The potential is much uh, much more. And therefore, for the T129 deal to go through, it's important that that should happen. Yes, and it can continue from land to the space. I mean, because it's a very potential, and both of the country uh, have tremendous amount of uh, know-how and uh, defense technologies to share to each other uh, in in um, in every sector of uh, military, like uh, navy, air force, and uh, and of course land force, uh, obviously, as as well as the space in future. Right. Thank you so much. It was Muhammad Walid speaking with us. This is all from In Focus tonight. We shall see you tomorrow at the same time. Keep following our latest updates on social media at Indus.news. Good night and goodbye.